Hey, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm here today with Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Hey, I'm well. How are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, it was great to have you. And uh, I know that, uh, so why, people that don't know who you are, what you do, where you're located, why don't you give us the background of who Andrew is? All right. Well, the virtual background here is a, dropping a big hint as to where I'm located. Uh, I'm in New York City. I'm actually born and bred here in Manhattan. And uh, at one time, I actually, I had an office in that, in that tall building, uh, uh, I guess, to my right. Um, or to my left as the viewer sees it. Uh, I'm very focused on data and analytics and business intelligence and more and more artificial intelligence. Uh, and the whole data story has been the one constant in my career going all the way back. A lot of that career was in consulting and then about 10 years ago I pivoted to be more focused on actually uh, covering it as a, a blogger journalist for ZDNet and also being an analyst, kind of industry watcher in that space uh, as well. I do that directly and independently, and I do a lot of uh, work in that regard with a, a research firm called GigaOM as well. So yeah, very cool. I, are, you know, I've been wanting to talk to you about that for a while because I think I, it, we're in different uh, uh, technology spaces, what we focus on. My background is collaboration technology, but similar to you, and I've, I've worked at you know, Microsoft, I worked for some ISVs, and went independent, and I'm more on the marketing side, but I do the the analyst and the in the independent research side of things, uh, predominantly within the collaboration space. And so right. I provide, you know, same thing. I do independent research. I work with major university here and uh, do papers and and other kind of research. But I get called by reporters and things all the time, and sometimes names, sometimes not, and provide input on different things that are happening around the collaboration space. So I'm just, I'm fascinated by that side. And obviously you do a lot of writing as well. I do. I, so, yeah. but, but like you, the press was tapping me for comments all the time. And then that kind of commenting on things became a hobby. And then I decided I really wanted it. I really wanted to make it my legit thing. Yeah, how do you that, monetize that? That's always the question with those kinds of things where it's always a fine line between, you know, you're asking a lot of questions, you're asking things that are more in depth. Right. These are things which I should be charging you for <laughs> rather than you doing your research, your job for you. Right, right. Well, I, you kind of laid it out there. Even if you weren't explicit, there's going to be stuff where you're just covering events and happenings and industry developments and maybe that is not something you'll monetize terribly uh, prolifically but then as you do that you gain you gain an awful lot of knowledge about the industry um, and then there are opportunities uh, on the analyst side um, where those things can be um, brought to bear professionally so that's that's kind of my story um, covering it as a journalist is not necessarily a a huge jackpot, but um, because of the timing that I uh, started, um, it ended up being where I was, you know, I was meeting a lot of the companies that we have now, companies like Cloudera, companies like Snowflake, when it was early days and when the CEOs were very technical. And because originally I'm from more of a technical background mm -hmm. uh, as a developer and as a database person and as, as a consulting person, it just led to fun conversations. Uh, I think the folks were pleasantly surprised that I kind of knew what databases and BI were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and that the, the timing was just dumb luck. I ended up really meeting lots of people in the industry early on in the, in the open source analytics industry. And then that just led to a good collection of uh, people that I knew and, 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 and a way to tap into everything and keep current. Um, and of course, you know, my background, much like yours, very much around the Microsoft stack, in my case, going back to the early 90s, um, yeah. the first version of Visual Basic and the very first version of SQL Server that ran on Windows, which even though it was the first version, it was version 4.2. Uh, because of that early pedigree and because I got interested in Microsoft's business intelligence technology 20 years ago and it was new 
and I was on <clears throat> their partner advisory council for BI for about five years. I just kind of grew up with all that stuff and I had a good understanding of the Microsoft stack. And then really by being on the partner advisory council, that's what opened my eyes to all the competition. And um, Mary Jo Foley, who covers Microsoft for ZDNet, knew that ZDNet was looking for somebody to cover big data and she asked if I'd be interested. And um, it took several months actually uh, from that initial inquiry to when I started writing, but that's, that's how it happened. It all, well, you know, it all goes back to SQL Server eventually. But, you know, it's interesting <laughs> because I, so I, I you know, had a little bit of experience in that space and worked in the data warehousing world you know, years back. Mm -hmm. I worked for Pacific Bell and I was in a shared wow. services organization actually for Telesis. So we worked, the parent company, we worked with PBIS, the information systems, as well as Pac Bell, our primary customer. And I was responsible for all the front end applications, business objects, uh, data strategy, SaaS, kind of all those tools that were the front end of these things. But I kind of moved away from those things into project and portfolio management, which was kind of my stepping stone into uh, knowledge management, information management systems, and into kind of the SharePoint space, like that direction. Yep. What's interesting to me is that when you started to hear the phrase, you know, uh, big data, uh, being bandied about. And I had worked for several years working with supply chain organizations and I owned project management side of, you know, that, that world, but was a product manager and project manager. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so when I started, you know, learning about these big data systems, I was like, well, big data, but that just sounds like so much of what I've been doing, you know, for these, for these years. But what's interesting is, so you started to see companies like Splunk and others, like major BI providers start to participate in tech ed and in other Microsoft, you know, conferences. My impression is that big data, that term is kind of dissolving into because yep. I, I say this all the time that, you know, uh, you know, any data issued in the modern collaboration stack you know, every problem is a big data problem. You know, massive amounts of data as the price of storage drop down and the complexity of all of these systems. And it's really just a parallel to what we were doing and calling this separate space of big data, you know, five, 10 years ago. Yeah, I, I mean, even at the time, it, a number of us understood that the notion of calling it big would be, eventually it would be kind of quaint and antiquated. <laughs> yeah. and, and really it was, it was just data. And in fact, ZDNet wanted to call the blog big data. And I asked if I, I skewed it a little bit. I said, can we call it big on data? <laughs> and that is what it's called. Because, uh, well, two things. First of all, I knew BI was germane even then. And I wanted to be able to talk about BI and not just what was all about Hadoop at that point. Right. Um, but also because I, I, I knew these things would come together. At that time, I was really out in the wilderness from relative to my Microsoft background. Big data was all about open source and Linux um, and you know Apache Software Foundation projects. And Microsoft at that time really wasn't there yet. Um, but eventually the two converged, uh, and I was, I was pretty sure they would. I also was pretty sure that, uh, that eventually data warehousing would become a legitimate big data technology as well. And, and that happened too. with Amazon right. with Redshift and, and Snowflake eventually kind of made sure of that. And yeah, we don't really say big data anymore. We tend to say data and analytics and more and more, we tend to talk about artificial intelligence and, and machine right. learning. Well, Which it, was germane well, 20 years ago, too. It's just that we right. called it data mining. <laughs> well, but, but one major shift that I think that Microsoft has a major role within that, again, my perception, you might have deeper insights into this, is that uh, you know, Microsoft was seen as uh, kind of slow to the party, uh, late to the party with a, with a lot of this. And whether that's true or not, you know, mm -hmm. because as you kind of look back over technology, I was just thinking of like the complaint now of Slack against, you know, uh, teams kind of thing. And, and somebody in, uh, wrote an, a great article a couple of days ago that said, well, no, if you go back and look at the history of teams and all of the products that, you know, it came from yep. link and communication server and kind of up through, it's like Microsoft has been in this space for 15 plus years. Yeah, and, and SharePoint for that matter, right? right. And, and it's not, SharePoint, it's not just the meetings, it's the collaboration. Right. Which is, and and you know, big forever. data much the same way. I think one thing that Microsoft 
uh, has done really well is this idea of the democratization of BI and mm -hmm. bringing it to the masses. And yes, there are, I, look, I, I live here in the world, like the Domo headquarters is right down the street. Yes. You've got, you've got uh, the, all these other players that are out there, but so much of where we are with end user, I mean, I'm, Something I talked about in a webinar a few weeks back was the ideas application, the ideas functionality in Excel, mm -hmm. which is like a gateway into, you know, the Power BI link to your simple, simple Excel data um, yep. and seeing these visualizations and being able to map those and take those over to Power BI and for end users that have no training in these tools to get kind of a jump start in and uh and creating these visualizations so yeah, microsoft the, the whole microsoft bi job. stack was also was always very close to excel i mean really pivot tables in excel were originally there to facilitate having a decent interface to talk to cubes and sql server analysis services and the two teams have had an intersection for quite a long time i'm sorry to interrupt but um since you mentioned excel i yeah i was like ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah 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 no no it's <laughs> Well, better you talking than me. I like I can hear myself talk all the time, but <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way about myself. But um, but in any case, yeah, the Microsoft has been in the space for quite a long time. Analysis services is actually kind of a seminal technology, and its query language MDX has been you know a thing in the analytics world for a long time and a real standard. Where they were weak for a long time, actually was stuff on the front end. And, and where they had the most success, in fact, was the intersection of Excel and SharePoint, this thing called Excel services at the time. That's really where they had their best BI stuff. And it took multiple iterations of trying. Eventually, they got to Power BI, and that's, that's where everything got really successful. But it, it took over a decade to, to get there. Well, Microsoft it, was always yeah. strong on the back end. The front end was, was much more arduous. But, you know, it's funny. It's my, my way, my, my path into the SharePoint world <laughs> was through Project Server and deploying it. I actually tried to talk my, that first client where I, my first real hands-on deployment tried to talk them out of it, going with a, an early but uh, working uh, uh, pure SaaS uh, portfolio management solution that what they really wanted, it wasn't like the interface side of it, it was the back end, it was the analytics around the data. We never got it working, we never really, this was in 2004, 2005, we never, you know, it just wasn't, oh, I, I know there's gonna be a lot of people that will complain about this, it wasn't a working product. In my, my experience, it just it just mm -hmm. didn't work. Um, and for those that will say it's like, well, you didn't have the right people working on it. Like we've uh, on Microsoft's advice hired the company that had deployed it at Coca Cola. And what we were trying to do, which was pretty much down the brochure, like this is what we want: project analytics. We want the data out of it. Um, right. We get the reality that we were asking for things which Microsoft made claims that they could do that right. Coca Cola had never you know use they Actually, they didn't go as in depth yeah you know. but yeah. anyway i that to beat a, a all that integration there, back but, then yeah. was very brittle and very dependent on kerberos authentication which i i think three people on the globe knew how to set up really well at that time <laughs> well i think that in the end of that story there of course is that i uh, uh it was frustrated project server but i caught the sharepoint bug uh uh -huh. early and then uh you know the, the rest of it is history but yep. it's a, but it's a, I think it just, it does go to Microsoft's strength has long been, while there might be very uh, uh, R&D DevOps focused solutions out there, not that Microsoft doesn't do that side of it. Microsoft has always been really good at taking these very complex concepts and, and ideas and technologies mm -hmm. and productizing it, mainstreaming it for the business user. And I think that's the evolution that has uh, it's it's speeding up now. It's happening I, so quickly. I but. think that's right. There's there's iterations of that though. So yes, they did that with straight database. They did it with BI. They've largely done it with with big data. With Synapse Analytics is 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 bringing Apache Spark to bear and making it a lot more accessible than you know the the kind of open source stack that you needed to get to it before. Although that works too. Um, 
where I think their next iteration is that they're really not that far down the path on is, is making machine learning as accessible to business users as the other stuff. There is some integration between Azure machine learning and Azure cognitive services on the one hand and power of the eye on the other, but there's, there's a longer way to go. Um, and Azure machine learning itself, while I would say it's, it's probably more business friendly than its competitors, it is still largely kind of in the, in the data science uh, lane and um, bringing it together with the rest of the stack, I think is the next, uh, the next important step for Microsoft well, and indeed for the industry because no one's really doing a great job at that yet. Well, you think about, uh, you know, the, the, probably the, the, what Microsoft is working on now, the next big thing that will be publicly available mainstream will be project cortex, whatever it ends up getting named. And so there you have some of that. It's the, you know, the productization of a lot of that technology. I, mm -hmm. I don't know how much you're familiar with it, if you're participating or providing, uh, you know, any input into some of the piloting that's that's happening now. Um, you know, but what are your Cortex, thoughts about Cortex, no. Mm -mm. Yeah, yeah it, so that's one of those things where um, it, it's it's a way of, of going in and putting a front end in a dynamic automated front end, so leveraging kind of all those tools, the, the AI, the machine learning, the cognitive services, the, uh, uh, to be able to uh, better get, you know, surface intelligently data within your massive amounts of structured and unstructured content within your, your system. Um, how that will actually work and how it will be managed and how much will actually be automated versus curated are all things that we all want to see i'm i'm interested in that i was kind of hoping you'd have a little more you know inside view into what's happening with it but with that particular project no but I, what i will definitely say the work that you know i do directly through blue badge insights and and the stuff i'm doing with giga ohm and with zdnet i mean that is definitely you know the desire out there is for machine learning to sort of enter the, you know, it's gonna be, it's always gonna be technical most likely, but to at least have it enter the mainstream kind of enterprise developer technologist stack rather than as I was saying before, kind of being in its, in its own lane. I mean, there will always be a need for data science and data scientists, but we're not gonna scale that population um, to the degree necessary to make machine learning really accessible to the broader addressable market. So we've got to, we've got to mainstream it more. Automated machine learning is part of the process of doing that. That makes it so that you can sort of bring your data to an ML platform and then the selection of algorithm and parameter values and all the, you know, the nitty gritty data science of it is something that can, for a lot of use cases, can be more, more automated. And then it, and then it really only takes a developer skill set or an analyst skill set to to put it to use um but right. there's even there there's still a way to go microsoft's auto ml is is pretty good but uh well, i think uh, on most most lists of like future job opportunities that are you know data scientists and, and just in any industry and uh so i've i've got three kids in college right now and i've said for to each of them in their respective areas like you know think about one is kind of taking this up and like yeah, i'm gonna go actually add it as a minor to his degree, which is a STEM related, it's uh, atmospheric sciences okay. um, at the University of Utah. And he added computer science with uh, data analysis as a minor. And so he's, I'm like, he, he's got, of course, all the licenses to all the Microsoft stuff. And, uh, and so he's starting to pick up and learn about that stuff. But, you know, my belief is that if you take that data analyst route in whatever the field that you're interested in, I mean, that's where the greatest opportunities are. And that's why you see like, where are all the jobs going to be in the next 20 years? And data scientists is like number one or number two in almost all of those lists. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so anyway, it's, so let me ask you the, the question about, you know, what are you most excited about of what Microsoft is working, working on? Stuff that's coming up that they've announced, obviously things that are publicly out, out there, uh, mm -hmm. hashtag no leaks. Right, right, absolutely. So I, I, my answer might be counterintuitive to you, although I 
alluded to it before, but um, as long as it's not PowerPoint, that'd be weird. It's not PowerPoint. <laughs> it's it's Synapse Analytics, which is in large part a rebrand of what was Azure SQL Data Warehouse, but what Microsoft is doing with it, first of all, is adding data lake technology to the data warehouse technology, and that's largely based on Apache Spark. But beyond that, what they're doing is they're tying in other services they already had, including Azure Data Factory and Power BI, and to a minimal extent thus far, but hopefully a growing extent, Azure Machine Learning. So my, my biggest beef about the cloud, you know, time frame here, whether we're talking about Microsoft or we're talking about Amazon or Google, is that the cloud providers have been really good at putting out all these sort of disparate services, all these building blocks, but they kind of sit there as islands of functionality. And there hasn't been a lot to kind of unite them into a single, you know, experience or just put it in a, you know, uh, an integrated development environment where it can all be brought to bear. That's actually the hallmark of Synapse is that it's doing that. And there's a decent possibility that similar integrations with some of the third party tools will happen there as well. So to me, you know, if we go with the cliche that the, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, I, that's the, that's the upside here. Most of what we have in there, we already had. If you put together Azure Machine Learning, Power BI, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, and maybe HD Insight, which has Spark as part of it, you would have had a, the same basket of functionality and technologies, but they weren't, they weren't coordinated. Um, and so yeah, to me- Why is that though? It, it just it, lost a ton of value. And now, now that value is starting to be realized. Yeah, yeah, so, so why is it? Why is it more fragment coming together? Is that just the nature of- the kind of the Microsoft research, developing parts of it, some from the product teams, some coming from industry in that Microsoft adopts or acquires in, and it's just fragmented that way? Or, or is it really that they're just, they're going down kind of the, the, the paths with different areas, they see the connections later and it just organically has to kind of come together? Is it kind of an I all think, of the above. I think the last of those is, is part of it. I think a big part of it is just the cloud provider mentality. And it's a little bit strange for Microsoft because, you know, cloud is a pivot. Obviously, they're an enterprise software technology by, by trade. Or, you know, if you go way back, they were building basic compilers for personal computers. But um, the cloud... The cloud mentality has been basically one of being a utility. So we're going to put up service one, we're going to put up service two, we're going to put up service three, and we're in the business of billing for compute and storage. I mean, I hate to sort of distill it down to that, but that's kind of what happens. And really, we're going to leave it up to other people to stitch those pieces together and come up with solutions. Um, but, you know, ultimately, that's... If, even if your whole goal is to have pull through on the basic services, you need to have a value added kind of experience that makes all those services more usable um, and it becomes a competitive necessity to do so. So while for all of us who have been in the consulting field for a while, it's great that you know we're, we're relied upon to bring everything together. I think it's still better if Microsoft provides a base level of integration. And there's always white space on top that solution providers can, can build upon. Um, right. And well, I think that's, is, why. that's why Microsoft's partner you know, uh, uh, network, you know, it, the Microsoft partner network is just that's so right. massive. I don't know what the number, what the claiming lately, I missed that on Inspire the last couple of weeks was, uh, but it's, uh, what, it's a, at least 500,000 global partners is probably more like, you know, six to 700,000. Wow. Uh, but uh, yeah, just, you know, just massive numbers, but yeah. I was one CTO at a, at a gold partner consulting firm and yeah, you know, we'd every year we'd make the, the pilgrimage to the partner conference now called Inspire. Um, and yeah, you sure got you sure got this like humbling experience. Like I thought I was the you know this cool guy partner with Microsoft, and then you get there and there's you know like you everyone everyone's yeah. special. A everyone <laughs> <laughs> and, there's, and the volume of special people is pretty darn high. That's right. Um, but it, but it's always but I think to your point though, I mean one of the things that's uh, it's just so exciting. I, I get your point. There needs to be that foundation. You know, people that are coming in, they're looking to Microsoft 
to provide a foundation. You get complaints when they don't find one area that it's quite there. There's not a working tool set that covers kind of all those different areas. From a partner perspective, I mean, Microsoft always says this, while they'll continue to innovate and add on and iterate on those things and maybe eventually provide that tool set, I mean, they, they say like, look, there'll be partners that are specialists in each of those areas, right. which will be better able to meet the customer needs, um, but with that value yeah. add onto the core that we provide. It's all, yeah, it's all a question of where you draw the line between platform and solutions on top of the platform. But also Microsoft's pattern largely is they go through like a period of lots of different teams innovating, you know, and building new things and everyone getting excited about that. And then there's, then there's another round where things get rationalized and brought together. Right. Sometimes that's about branding. Sometimes that's, you know, down to the level of APIs and standards, but you know, the, the notion of integrating these things becomes a matter of fit and finish that tends to come as a sub subsequent um, round of work, not the initial round of work. And the, the cloud is mature enough where we're, we're getting to that subsequent round. And so that's you, what we've got. You know, it's interesting that with our, with ourselves or our own companies, and we give a lot of leeway to iteration to be able to kind of, you know, it's failure, fight, you know, and then, kind of regroup, uh, reiterate on that thing and push it back out there. And we don't give that same space to OEMs like Microsoft for those to go out there and learn and iterate. But I mean, that's just what we see what's going on. It's, it's just happening a lot faster than it used to, um, yeah. which is an adjustment. And I know my Microsoft is struggling. I think there's even been some calls to throttle some of the innovation that's coming out, certainly in the like Teams, the you know office apps and services space, um, so slow Microsoft down. to slow things down so that people down. can absorb it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah. And, and and as soon as they do, then people will complain. It's, yes. Something's not happening fast. Uh, there's no way to win there. So you can't um, please all of the customers and partners all of the time. No, no, you cannot. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that the calls to slow down those happen every once in a while. That to me, that's a that's a that's an indicator of things that are good. I, I've never really seen Microsoft heed that. You know, no. eventually they'll slow down anyway. Actually, I believe big data was a huge, mostly a huge reaction to the fact that the entire database and analytics space had been largely ossified for about 15 years. There had been very little change. I mean, sure, new version of SQL Server every three years, new versions of Oracle, new versions of IBM DB2, new versions of the BI platforms, but they were so incremental and so, you know, evolutionary. And you know, things got, you know, more and more expensive, especially on the data warehouse side, where a lot of the companies were really just monetizing storage. The big thing about Hadoop was they said, okay, we're gonna make it so that the storage is just based on commodity disks inside of the commodity servers, and we'll set it up so if those disks fail, there's two more behind them. And the whole reliance on enterprise storage and all of the economic model that went with that was totally uprooted. To me, that was what the big data um, revolution was all about was just kind of upsetting that that high barrier to entry franchise of the way the data warehousing world worked. Um, we saw a lot of it, that shift was happening around uh, shift was happening like 2000 2001. You had a Global Grid Foundation. You had uh, you know, starting to look at that these compute farms of, of ways of uh, you know automated movement between those. It just uh, I mean that that was an interesting time. I was in the IBM world at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and working with rational software and ah. and my own startup and kind of that space and so saw a lot of you know interesting things but you're right it just it kind of got quiet for a while after that not that innovation wasn't happening but it, it just uh it's cyclical i mean yeah. stability is good we need stability so that that slowdown that you were talking about can occur and we can digest everything and get good at it and you know kind of make things more navigable but eventually you get too comfortable. I don't mean you, Christian, I mean, yeah. <laughs> one gets too comfortable. And, uh, and then what happens is there, there, there's this buildup, this pent up demand for new stuff to happen. And, you know, it's, you know, it's if you ever read the book by Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific of, uh, Revolutions, it's exactly what it is. Everything gets comfortable, the theorems get all settled, the science gets all settled, 
and then there tends to be some big bang change that upsets the whole order of things and then a new a new order kind of settles so yes. yeah it's a you know, it's a fascinating space it's uh you know uh, uh, definitely a space to watch in the microsoft ecosystem as well so uh, andrew uh, you, people want to find out more about you get in touch with you how do, how do they reach you where do they find you uh, gosh, www.bluebadgeinsights.com is one way. And my first and last name, all in one word, Andrew Brust, B-R-U-S-T, on Twitter. Um, those are two good ways. Or just Google my name and uh, the ZDNet stuff and the GigaOM stuff will, will show up as well. Um, I have a lot of stuff out there. So you, the search engines are pretty good at flagging a lot of it. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate your time this afternoon. It's great uh, catching up with you and maybe one day we'll see each other again. I look forward to that and I hope it's I hope it's sooner rather than later. This is this has been ongoing for a while and let's see what happens. Yeah, and enjoy that uh, nice toasty weather there in New York City. <laughs> Every summer. Yeah. We always do. All right. Well, th thanks a lot. Be well. Take care. Wow.